All right. Uh, anyone hear me? Can everyone, those people at the back hear me? Okay, great. Okay, uh, hi guys. My name is Omar. I used to be a student here. I was from computer engineering. So how many of you are from computer engineering? I only see a handful. How many from computer science? Is everyone else, I guess. Okay, nice. <laughs> Yay. So this is a somewhat hardware software talk. I will try to cover more of the hardware part since you guys don't know much about it and I can get away with it. Okay, and I want to talk a bit about how I got into this. So I work, uh, so I work at C. Uh, I'm not sure if everyone heard of C, but uh, we used to be called Garena. And we work on quite a few interesting projects. I happen to be working on this new project that we haven't released yet. It's related to live streaming. And I happen to do a lot of video processing work recently. So that's what got me into GPU programming. Okay, okay. So let's get into it. So okay. So let's get into it. So what is a GPU? I guess most of you know what a GPU is, right? You guys play games, so you must know what a GPU is. Uh, but if you really think about what exactly is a GPU, when you work with it, or if you want to program for it, right? Then it's a different question. A GPU, if you think about it, is a piece of hardware that is optimized to render graphics. But not just that, it can actually do a lot of different things. The philosophy in terms of hardware for GPUs is that it com is composed of units that, of many, many units that help it do a lot of simple but parallel operations concurrently. And that's why it happens to be good for graphics and it happens to be good for a lot of, a lot of parallelizable algorithms, okay? So, we're going we're gonna to jump into that in quite a bit of detail later on. But first, what I want to get you guys around and wanna, what, I want to, what I want to illustrate to you guys is the graphics pipeline. That is, how really are graphics rendered on your screen when you use a GPU? And what does coding stuff for the GPU looks like for modern day devices, especially in my case, particularly iOS, because I'll be focusing on iOS since I am an iOS developer, okay? So when I say the graphics pipeline, what I mean exactly is how to draw stuff, how to draw shit on the screen, okay? And like any graphics tutorial, we're gonna start off with triangles, because triangles form the fundamental basis of how you draw anything else. Everything else is composed of triangles, okay? So. The whole story for rendering starts off with these thing called vertices, okay? Vertices are just points in space. And if you think about it, you look at this triangle, it is just composed of vertices 0, 1, 2. These vertices are just points in some arbitrary space, okay? You don't really need to define what the space is. This could be your 3D model, for example. If you have a 3D model that looks pretty nice, uh, with a few million vertices. It, so this, these, all these vertices can represent, for example, your car model or something. They're just points, okay, in, in, in this space. So what do we do with these points? What we will define is this thing called a vertex function, okay? A vertex function's job is to transform these vertices that are in some arbitrary 3D space into this normalized device space, which is a 2D space, okay? So these device coordinates, uh, they're also called uh, clip space coordinates, okay? They exist in this special coordinate space. So on iOS, this coordinate space uh, basically has this, this kind of structure lights. It varies from minus one to one uh, on both X and Y axis. So like this is 0 0.5, for example, uh, so this is one for example, on both sides, okay? So this is the reason we do this is to normalize everything. So everything, so when, at render time, whatever arbitrary space you are using at render time and you want to display on the screen, you know exactly what the coordinates roughly are gonna, are roughly are gonna be, okay? So for example, if we look at back at our triangle, if you want to render a triangle like this with some rotation involved, uh, the, way we, the way we would do that in a GPU context would be we will need to specify a vertex function, okay? And a vertex function will execute once per vertex, 
Okay, so that means you we have three vertices. It will be called once for this vertex, once for this vertex, once for this vertex, and that's how the GPU will sort of know. Okay, uh, I have these three vertices. I know where they exist in this clip space. Okay, clear so far. Okay. So what does a vertex function look like, and how do we define one? Let's say, let's say I want to write some code now because I'm sick of looking at triangle diagrams. Okay. So in terms of code, right? Now this is some uh, simple C plus C C plus plus kind of code. Uh, if you don't know C C plus plus, you guys need to take your one 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 again. But like basically, it's just a struct. I have a struct here. I have Inside the struct, I have two properties. Okay, one property is position. Position is just a floating point vector of two of two components. Vector of two components because I have x and y direction. Okay, uh, so position. So this is just a position, and and I have a color. In this case, uh, the color is RGBA. So I have four components in my color, and that's why it's a vector of four components. Okay, so in my use case, because I'm just rendering a boring triangle with just one color in a 2D space, because I'm not very adventurous right now, uh, I just have this struct. Okay. In your use case, obviously this vec this vertex can be very different. Maybe you want to do some very intense stuff with lighting. You want to have a different. You want to have 3D uh, coordinates. You want to pass a bunch of things. My point is, this struct can be whatever you want it to be. This is just one way to represent a vertex. That it, in, for the GPU. You, it can be anything, okay? This is uh, this is kind of arbitrary, okay? So this is a vertex. I also need to define what will my vertex function return, okay? And this is where things get a bit interesting. So remember, I mentioned last time a vertex function's definition is it will take a vertex, or it'll take it'll take one vertex. Each function will be will take one vertex at a time, and will return to you the device space, the, the normalized clip space coordinates. So where is that vertex on my screen? That's what the vertex function will return to you, right? So we need to represent some structure that contains that information. And maybe we want to pass some other information as well. So one way to do that is we can define another structure, another struct. Let's call this struct uh, rasterized data. Okay? And this thing has two, two properties. Okay? One property is the uh, clip space position, okay. This is the actual position of the of the point in the clip space, the device space, and it's a float for, and I'll explain why in a, in a bit. And we also pass the color, okay. And you can ignore this for now. Ignore ignore all this comment for now because you won't understand it. But the main thing to note here is that my position has this special uh, funky looking tag around it, okay. So. I have this struct, right? I need to somehow tell the com tell the GPU or tell the hardware that which of these fields is the position, is which of these fields is the position attribute, okay? So that the GPU knows that this is the vertex, the uh, the output of my vertex vertex function that I need to use later on, and that's how I do this. I use this funky looking thing. This is a part of metal syntax, okay? This will help me indicate this property is a is is a vertex position, okay? And and because of this function, I can actually have a much more complicated complicated struct. As long as I mark one of those properties as position, the vertex function will be able to execute correctly because it will know that which of those properties are the position, okay? And this thing is a float for because uh, you later we might need to deal with three D space, so you might need you might need more than just two coordinates. In my case, I will just use the first the first two. Okay. So now I will show you the function definition, just the definition, not the implementation, of a vertex simple vertex shader. Okay, or simple vertex function in metal. Okay. So just before we go on, just to clarify for those of you who don't know this, metal is iOS's or Apple's GPU API, okay? Uh, GPU programming language. It's a programming language that's, that is a superset of C and C++. That is why the code you saw earlier looks like looks pretty similar, looks, might look familiar. It's a superset of C, C++. Everything that is valid C, C++ is valid metal code. 
Obviously, you cannot use the standard library or you cannot use any of the inbuilt functions that you might be familiar with C, C++ because you're running on a GPU now. So if you want to do simple operations, you have to use the metal standard library to do them. Because, and the reason for this is because normally your standard libraries are designed for CPUs, right? They will, when they compile, they will compile into CPU instructions. That's not the case for metal. For metal, you are compiling for the GPU. And GPU instructions look very different. The kind of programming model you have is also very different. So you can't you reuse that standard library. You can't reuse a lot of existing code that you might have. Okay. So coming back to this vertex function, okay. Uh, so this is what a vertex function will look like, okay. And remember last time I mentioned. Let's look at this one by one. So we have a we have a this first thing called vertex. This is a keyword. It's a keyword to identify that this function is a vertex function, okay? Then we have the output struct that we define. This is the output of this function. This is something we defined earlier. It can be anything, like I said, as long as you uh, specify where is the position attribute inside the struct, it can be any, any data structure you want it to be, okay? The name of the function, and then there's a few arguments if you notice, okay? The argument that, one of the arguments that is important is the vertex ID. So remember last time I mentioned that a vertex shader will execute once per vertex? You need some way to identify which vertex you're at right now. And this is what the vertex ID is for, okay? If you use uh, OpenGLES or some other similar equivalent on other platforms, they also have similar concepts, okay? Then the other thing in that we need, obviously, are our input vertices, right? So because we are taking some vertices as input, and we are converting them into some output vertices on this clip space thing, okay? And so we will pass those vertices. So this is, if you remember, we defined this type last time. This is our type that we define for vertex that contain a position and a color, right? It's over here. I pass these vertices in uh, in this, and this this basically is a pointer. So it basically means this is an array, okay? But if you notice this this funky thing on the side, this is this attribute means that this thing is a buffer, okay? Why is this there? Why do we need this? And why, you probably understand why we need this, right? Because the vertex ID is provided by the GPU system. So that's why we need to annotate this argument as the vertex ID. What this buffer means is that this vertex, this vertex buffer is, is something that's provided by the GPU systems. It's not a, because this thing is not a normal function. You can't just call it like a normal function, you like you have a main, and then you call this function. It doesn't work like that. Normally, for this kind of metal, uh, GPU setup, you need to configure these functions and call them in on the CPU side. Uh, so I'll show you example of example of what I mean later on. Okay, but what this buffer attribute actually means is that this is the real this this is the buffer that will be passed to you from the native side, from the CPU side. And the buffer at the zeroth index contains the vertices. The buffer at the first index contains this other argument, which is the viewport size. In my case, I have a viewport size because I wanna, I, I'm rendering on some screen, so I need to know what's the size of that screen in order, in order to know what the exact coordinate will be. Because like I mentioned, when we return from this function, we return something in a normalized space. That's a, that's, that's a fixed size, so if, if you wanna handle things like different Aspect ratios, we need to pass a size, okay? Okay, so anyone not clear till this point or anyone thinking this makes no sense? Anyone have any questions at this point? Like, like I can stop for questions at this point. Okay, so far, so far it's not that complicated yet. Okay, okay, good. Then the next step, right? So after we have vertices, you can imagine we've, we've so we have something in 2D space now we, have, we know our points in 2D space, okay? We know what our output is gonna be. What's the next step we have to do? We need to do this thing called rasterization. That means we need to find out what pixels are, in, are going to be included in our triangle, right? Because when you actually render something on a screen, you are rendering it in terms of pixels, right? So you have this pixel, you can look at this figure, ignore this text for now. But if you look at this figure, there's a bunch of pixels here, right? So when I render a triangle, obviously there is, I, I, I can't render across. I need to know which exact pixels will be part of my triangle, right? 
So the nice thing about GPUs is that they handle this automatically for us. Okay. This is called rasterization, this process. Okay. And normally in programmable GPUs, you are not responsible for it. The GPU will automatically handle this for you. Okay. So how so the next question will be then how can you control what to show at each pixel? Like if you want to color each pixel, what do you do? Right? Let's say you have some very sexy lighting model that you want to apply and you want to color each pixel with some very special color. Then the way to do that will be you need to implement this thing called a fragment function. Okay? A fragment function will be called for each of these fragments that are rasterized. So for each pixel that is included in your that is included in your triangle, you will you a fragment function, you can program a fragment fragment function. And that fragment function will be called on a per pixel basis, and that way you can specify what's the color you want for that pixel. Okay? So for example, here's a very simple fragment function. I just pass it so you can see it's called fragment. It returns a float four. Float four is because I'm returning a color, and color needs RGBA, so that's why it's float four. And it's a fragment shader. I call it fragment shader. It takes in the output that I got from my vec from my uh, vertex shader actually, and this funky looking attribute that tells me that this is indeed the output from my uh, vertex shader. Okay, and in this case, basically, I will just return a color, return the same color that I that I passed when I was in the when I created this vertex. So to go back to recap. So I go back to my definition of what I return in my vertex shader. Okay, in my vertex shader, I return a position. So you all know position, right? Position is fine. I can specify a position in 2D space, no problem. Let's say now I want to also specify a color, right? And I want to vary this color based on the position of where, of where it's in. I want to interpolate this color. Okay. The way, so in order to do that. If I so if if I have any so basically in for this structure right any output from the vertex shader, if you don't have a special tag around that special tag around that field, that output will be interpolated over a fragment. Okay, what do I mean by that? What I mean is that the values of that field will be will nicely vary depending on their position with respect to the vertices. Okay. So the colors, if you specify a color, it will vary. It will it will be interpolated automatically for you. So the rest, this is this is something that the rasterizer will do for us. Okay, I'll show you guys an example later on to make this clear because I know what I'm when I say it, it's not exactly that clear. Okay. So uh, let me let let me stop here and let's look at a demo. Okay, to understand so far what what I exact what exactly I mean. Okay. So. Okay. Okay. Can you guys see this code? Is this visible? Everyone can see this, right? Uh, okay. Here I have some simple. I have the hello world example for GPU programming. It's called hello triangle. Okay, and let me just run it to show you what it does first, and then I'll go through how it does it. Okay. S so, give it a bit of time to come. Give it some time to compile. And okay, it's done. And uh, where is my Okay, here we go. Yay, triangle. Okay, so okay, so when I said interpolated color, this is what I meant, right? So in this particular case, my, one of my vertices is blue, one of my vertices is green, one of my vertices is red. Okay, that's the color I specified in my vertex data. Okay, when I render this triangle, it automatically interpolated that color value. And it did it in such a way that it's unif that it uniformly distributed across based on the distance of the vertices. There's a term for it. I forgot the term exactly that, that, that they use for this kind of interpolation. Okay? So this is, this is what I meant by inter interpolation. Okay? And if I look at 
my shaders for this for this example. So it's similar to what I showed you guys earlier. This is the vertex shader. Okay, it takes in uh, so it takes in the vertex ID, takes in a bunch of vertices and the size. It will do some simple transformation to find the uh, so it, it, it gets the out the viewport size and it will find the basically the position that we want. In which case, to get the position, it just divides the viewport size by two and uh, specifies some color based, uh, and that's it. Okay, it's a very simple two line two line shader, and my fragment shader just actually returns the color that I pass in from this thing. So if you notice, this is so this was the output. So this is the in, this was the input as I mentioned to my shader, the position, and the color. So when I when I create a vertex, I specify a position and a color, and 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 the color value later on will be interpolated. Okay, that's what I meant by interpolation. Okay, so that's all for that's all for this this part. Okay, next, let's say. In GPU, normally when you use GPU, you don't want to map each pixel by pixel, right? So if you think about from like a game point of view, or you're thinking like you're running on some 3D text, 3D thing, you don't want to go point by point, right? Individually, that's quite wasteful. Normally you have this thing called texture. A texture, which is an image that will be applied, applied on your 3D model or your 2D model or whatever, right? So a texture will be used to color, so to speak, your uh, thing on your whatever you want to do on, on a, in the final output, okay? So if so, how will a texture work? If you think about it, uh, a texture making a texture work is quite simple. It's quite similar. So in this, in our case, we changed the definition of our vertex. Last time we used to have a color. Now let's instead change that to a texture coordinate, okay? So in st over here, I have a vector float two, a texture a texture coordinate. So basically, this is the coordinate I want for that position in the texture space, okay? So if I have, if I'm rendering like a triangle, right, this is the first vertex, for example, and this is the, this is the color, this texture coordinate refers to the point in the texture which I want to map to that vertex, okay? So texture is just a 2D, it's just a 2D texture, okay? So for texture coordinates, uh, this is the texture coordinate space, basically starts from, it yeah, goes from zero to one, on, on all directions, uh, middle center that 0 0.5. Don't ask me why it's different from the cliff, cliff space. I don't know why. Okay, and and basically same thing as before. We have some vertex output. So when after we are done processing the vertex, we need to tell, we need to pass this data to the fragment shader, fragment shader, and the output. Once again, we have the cliff space, and we mark it with this position tag, and we have a texture coordinate. The same thing with color as before. The texture coordinate will be interpolated for each fragment. Okay, that's that's the that now you can see why you want this interpolation, right? Because it's interpolated, you can then find the position where what which part of the texture you want for this pixel. Okay, that that's the main reason why this thing is quite helpful. Okay, so but when you have a texture, one of the things you need to be aware of is you can't you the texture may not exactly map may not be the same size, right, as your as what you want to render. You might have a texture that's too small or too big for your image. So how do you do this? How do you handle that? And in order to handle that, we have this concept called a sample, a sam a sampler, okay? We will, what we will do is we will sample the texture to find that, okay, at this position, what's the color? You run some algorithm and you give me a color. Okay. So, it will, so there's a bunch of different algorithms it has. One of the simple algorithms is to do linear sampling It'll just look around and do an average of uh, to find like what should your roughly what should your color roughly be, okay? So this is what roughly the code looks like. You just create a texture sampler, you sample the texture, and and that's it, okay? You, and you're done. And this this is one way through which you do texture sampling, okay? So okay, why do I mention this, right? So my, people might be thinking in the, in the abstract. So why am I talking about this? And especially why am I talking about textures in this talk, right? The reason I'm talking about textures is if you think about video, right? So think about your video player. What exactly is a video player doing? A video player gets images, right? So when you send a request, when you open YouTube, for example, 
you are going to be receiving chunks of data that represent that are encoded with your data, right? When you decode that data, so you decompress that data, you will get these series of images, right? So time, time equal one, this image, time equal two, this image, etc. So what you do is you take that image, and that's a texture, right? So you put that texture, you feed it to the GPU to render it, and that's why that's how video rendering works, right? You just need, and then you apply some uh, transformation on it. Let's say you because you want to rotate that image because your device is rotated or something. You apply some transformation on it, and that's how video rendering works. Okay, that's why I uh, that's why I talked about texture. Okay, okay. So before we jump to the demos, actually, I'm going to talk a bit about GPU architectures first. Okay, before we jump to demos. Okay, so for GPUs, right? If you think about GPUs. Uh, Let's look at what a GPU looks like if you take the lid off, okay? So a GPU, if you, this is what a few components of a GPU, okay? So GPUs normally will, like any other uh, integrated system, they will have uh, some power system, they will have some interface, they will have some memory controllers, uh, some display interface stuff that basically uh, interfaces with the uh, display hardware, and they will have some, many of them will have a video processing unit. This is to implement the encoding decoding algorithms in hardware because that's a lot more efficient than doing it in software okay so but we are not going to focus on all these we are going to focus on the main core of the gpu which is the graphics and computer ray okay this is the actual rendering engine of a gpu okay and this is something we're going to focus on okay so what makes the question i have to you is what makes a gpu different from a cpu okay that's a very simple question and i'm going to try to answer that question so we go a bit deeper. And what I want you to think about is, so I have this very simple shader over here. Okay, This is a program. So you think of it first, let's think of this program from a CPU point of view, and we'll slowly assess how to optimize it. Okay, So we have a very simple shader here, and this shader does some algorithm. You can ignore what the algorithm is. I don't care. Okay, But let's look at the output, the assembly output. In, so the actual instructions that will output. Okay. And if you think about it from a CPU point of view, right, the, you will have, let's say you have this code, it will create a bunch of instructions, right? So there will be some sample instructions, some, some mathematical instructions, right? Some multiplication, addition, clamping, more multiplication happening here, right? It's a bunch of instructions. And if you're a CPU, you will go through them one by one, right? Sort of one by one, unless, like, obviously, if you have pipelining and stuff, you obviously have to take that into account. But basically, you will go one by one for each pixel, right? So if this, because this is a fragment shader, you're going pixel by pixel. So you need to execute these instructions, this bunch of stuff, for each pixel, OK? That, so normally, if you have a 720 by 1080p image, that's a few, that's a few million pixels. So you have to instru inst execute these instructions a few million times, OK? You can see how that can be problematic if, if you use a, a, just a pure CPU, right? Let's look a bit deeper into a CPU. So what is exactly the CPU, right? If you think about a CPU, it has a bunch of components. It has something in char that handles the decoding and fe decoding of the instruction, fetching that and fetching that instruction. It has an ALU which does the actual execution. It has some execution context. This is like the, could be the stack, the function, the function call stack, etc. Normally they will have a cache. And this is a big part of a CPU, right? You'll have L1 cache, L2 cache, L3 cache. And this is a, these are very important for a CPU. And you have a whole bunch of very fancy features that, C, that CPUs have these days. They have this out of order logic, a very fancy branch predictor, some memory prefetching, et cetera. If you guys want to talk more about this, talk to Rajesh. He's here. He teaches a module on this stuff. Yeah. OK. So, C, so CPUs have all this very fancy stuff that makes them very good at doing complex tasks, but not that many of them, OK? So here's an idea, right? I have a suggestion. Why don't we slim the CPU down? Let's cut away some of those parts, OK? So that we can have more of them on a hard piece of hardware, OK? It's a very simple idea. So let's, let's remove all this fancy stuff, and let's just keep the basics. Let's just keep the fetch, the code cycle, the ALU, and some execution context. So we can just run instructions. We don't care about caching. We don't care about branch prediction. We don't care about all this other stuff. Okay. So if you do that, now the nice thing is that I can have more of these, right? Because 
I have fewer components, so I can put more on my piece of hardware, I can develop, make it cheap as well, right? So if I have two of them, I can run these two in parallel, right? So I can basically, I sort of get, um, I can sort of have many, many cores, so to speak, and, and this is cheap, and, and this, this can work fine. So this is one strategy I can do, right? So, and this is something that GPUs do. So GPUs, like this is, like some GPUs, for example, here's a sample GPU, they have 16 cores, okay? And this is fine because the cores themselves are quite lightweight. They're not doing that much. It's, very, it's, it's quite simple, okay? And each core can execute one fragment at a time. So I can do 16 pixels in parallel at the same time. That's much better than one pixel or two pixels in parallel, right? If you do a simple traditional CPU, you can only have four cores maybe, two cores, eight cores if you're special. So this is much already, we're already a bit better than some CPUs, okay? But we can do better. We can go further than this, okay? So how do we go further than this? One idea is that a lot of fragments, right, because our instructions, if you look at the fragment shader, that code is the same for a lot of fragments, right? So what we can do is a lot of these fragments, they can share the instructions, inst instruction stream. The code is the same, the data is different, right? So if you think about it, the stuff that you are doing is actually the same for all these pixels. But it's just that their values are different. So we can actually use this thing called SIMD processing. SIMD stands for single instruction multiple data. Okay? What this means is you have one instruction, but you execute on a large chunk of data at the same time. This way you can optimize your hardware a bit more because uh, you have to do, you basically you have to build less hardware, right? Because there's less stuff, be, less, less stuff happening, okay? So we can utilize this technique. And if you look back at our, at our code, right? So this is the compile code. Originally, these instructions operate on one floating point at variable at a time, right? So they will, this multiplication instruction will operate on this one floating point number, okay? So if we change that instead, to a vector operation, okay? So this is a vector operation. What this means is it's still multiplication, but the inputs are two vectors. So I'm processing eight fragments at one time. I'm doing eight pixels at, at, the, at the same time in parallel, okay? Because I can do a multiplication of these two vectors and get an output vector, okay? And this is a lot faster and it's more, it makes more efficient use of my hardware, okay? So this is the second idea, that we change each shader to SIMD instructions, okay? So, yeah, here's this, so, so, in this, so here's an example. Uh, so here I have eight pixels, right? So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight pixels. Each of them will be fed as a vector array into this, instruction, into this shader, and each will be given a color, but they are still part of a vector, okay? So that's, that's the bright, bright idea here, and this thing is quite common, actually. It's not just common in GPUs. Vector processors actually exist in your traditional CPUs as well. They are in many modern day CPUs, they, they, they are there actually. So if you use an iOS device, it comes with a vector processor as well. And it's quite a useful, useful thing to have. Okay. So now the nice thing is, yay. Now I can do, if I combine the previous to-do approaches, so I have 16 cores and I have eight SIMD instructions per core, so I can do 16 multiplied by eight, so 128 fragments in parallel now, which is much better. I'm 128 times faster than a single core CPU, right? So life is pretty good. And I can do 16 simultaneous instruction streams, so which means that I can actually do 16 different programs at the same time if I want to, okay? So this is quite good. But we have one big problem now. Remember last time we got rid of all the caches, right? We got rid of all the branch prediction stuff, and all the nice CPU stuff. And all that stuff actually is there for a reason. It's there for a reason because, if you know, fetching from memory is goddamn slow, okay? If you think about it, how many cycles does it take to do a multiplication, or to do a bit shift, or to do an addition? These will maybe take one to 10 cycles, like not that many. The order magnitude is quite small. But fetching something from memory can take 
a few hundred cycles. It's an order of magnitude slower. The way CPUs fix this problem is through caching. So L1, they'll have this L1 cache. So they have this first thing they have is a register. A register is free. You can, it's almost one cycle to access it, or a few cycles only. Now you have L1 cache, which is the tens of cycles, L2 cache is hundreds of cycles, etc. Like basically the number of the order of magnitude to fetch from L1, L2, L3 is much faster than to fetch fetching from memory. Okay? And that's the bright light. That's why CPUs have caches. And that's why if you run your program to optimize for caches, you, it'll, it'll magically run a lot faster, even though you're using the same algorithm. This is something that, this is like this is one of these funny things you see if you if you if you optimize your programs a lot, okay? So, the thing is, we have this thing called stalls, right? So a stall happens when you cannot run an instruction because of some dependency, and because the previous dependency is taking too long, okay? So once again, I mean, uh, so so here's a CPU example, right? So CPU has L1, L2, and CPUs can execute quite efficiently when the data is in cache. Right, because caches are close, they're close to the CPU, it's much faster to access them. The data pipeline that they, the, pi the data connection that they have with the CPU is much faster compared to uh, memory, which is, which, is bound, which is bound by, like, you know, it, it cannot be as fast as the L1, L2 cache. Okay? So the thing is, in GPUs, right, we have this thing, we have a lot of I.O. operations. So if you think, think about it, things like textures, right? I talked about textures earlier. Textures involve uh, doing memory fetching because I need to read the texture memory, right? And I need to use it in my shader. And these can have very high latency. Like it can be 100 to 1,000 cycles, right? So like I mentioned, we removed all that fancy caches. So the problem now is that we will have stalls because when we are doing, when we are doing uh, IO operations, we're going to get stuck. So in this case, for example, let's look at this, let's look at an example here. Let's say I have a fragment shader and a fragment shader, and at this point, is doing some I/O work, right? It will be stuck. So I got to wait for this to finish, right? So how do I fix this problem? So how do I f how do I op still make use of my hardware? And the simple idea here is just run it in parallel. What that means is just just apply some scheduling tricks, so that if I'm stalling right now, I can schedule the next bunch of fragments that were scheduled and run those instead while I wait for this guy to finish stalling. And I can, so when this guy stalls, I can start loading the next bunch and so on. This way I have full utilization of my hardware without doing, wasting any time waiting for my IO to finish, okay? So these are some kind of scheduling, scheduling tricks that GPUs will use because they don't have uh, caching or they don't have branch prediction and all those fancy things, okay? So that ends the theory part of my talk, okay? So let me go back now to the promised demos, okay? So let me open some, okay. So let me open a simple demo for, to show you some code for how does it work with uh, buff with uh, textures, okay. So let's. I'm gonna do some simple. It's a very simple application. So I have this image. So here's what here's what I want to do. Okay. So I have this image. Okay, this is, you can imagine this code is designed to be a low level video player that renders only one frame. Okay. It's the most useless video player possible, but it's a start. And this is what it does. It just renders the image you saw earlier. And it just renders, renders it on the screen, okay? But why am I showing this off? Because this is quite s simple and stupid. The reason I'm showing this off is because I'm doing this directly by programming the GPU directly, okay? Because if you think about images, how you render an image, this is how the hardware exactly will render an image, okay? So uh, I'll just show you guys some code for how we set this thing up for how, how this whole GPU pipeline is set up in iOS at least, okay? So in iOS, what the way it works is we have this concept of a metal device that we will use. This, this refers to the actual hardware that we are rendering. And we have, what we need to specify in iOS is this thing called a render pipeline. And a pipeline has this thing called a command queue, which is the 
bunch of instructions that I want to queue for this GPU. And this queue will basically, uh, every time I have a new instruction, I will queue them on this, on this, on, on this uh, queue, okay? So in this example, I have some, some, some code to basically load a texture. And then I have a bunch of vertices. And these vertices, right, are pixel positions mapped to texture coordinates, okay? So this is the same struct you saw earlier. It's just position and texture coordinates. So these are positions and texture coordinates. In this case, this thing is just a square. It's just two triangles. It represents a quad, right? This is one triangle. This is another triangle. These two triangles together make a square, okay? And I will pass these bunch of vertices and I will create what is called a buffer in Metal. And the one fun thing about Metal, right, is, oh, hold on, let me expand this. So one fun thing about Metal is, in Metal and in iOS in general, memory is shared between CPU and GPU, okay? So normally you might have heard of this problem that if you have, if you're using a plug-in GPU that copying buffers from GPU to your video card is often very slow. It's often an iOS intensive operation. So one way that mobile devices get around it, or one way that iOS gets around it, is it will share memory. It will mark this memory space as shared between iOS and between uh, GPU and CPU. That means that the GPU can DMA that memory directly. It has direct memory access to that direct access to that piece of memory, and so does the CPU. So that's why I my buffers in in Metal will be shared. Okay. And this is when I remember last time I mentioned that you need to, the way you invoke a vertex and shader and a fragment shader is you need to basically configure them in some way. So in this case, I configure them by getting them from this library thing, which will contain the compiled versions of those of that code. And then I can set up a pipeline basically, and uh, I build basically, yeah, it's a bunch of stuff now. And what will happen in each frame is this is this is the code that will happen in each frame. In each frame, I will basically specify what the, what are the vertices I want for that frame, what is, the, what is the texture I want for that frame, and then I will draw that frame and I will pass it to my command buffer, okay? That's the gist of it, okay? So the point here is that uh, the way to think about stuff when you think about the GPU is you need to think about it in terms of vertex buffers, vertex shaders and, sh and, fragment, and, and fragment shaders and you need to pass the appropriate arguments. In this case, my, in this case it's my buffers, uh, my, is, this, is this buffer uh, and, and the texture. You need to pass these arguments in each draw call. Okay? So if I was to animate this, for example, I was to have some animatable stuff, this stuff will change per draw call. I could do some animation, I could change the vertices I'm providing, that way I can have some animation and nice effects, and that's how animation frameworks work. They will change the vertices in each frame, and that way you can get some animation effects. Okay, so that's that's all I have. Okay, uh, this was a pretty low-level talk. So, are there any questions now? Okay, feel free to ask any questions. And and yeah, if you guys want to know more. <coughs>